All right. Hey, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I am Erin Eckert, the chair of the East Tennessee section. Just going to go over a couple of quick announcements. All right. So just a note about this no this program, it is being recorded recorded for non-public use by Eastman and the East Tennessee ASEG local section. Uh, we, once we've posted it online afterwards, we will send out the link. So if anyone couldn't make it, they'll be free to free to watch it then. Or if you just want to rewatch it, that'll be fine as well. We do plan on having one more program this this front half of the year to make up for the program that we have or we missed in February. Um, it will be for PDH credit and you can look for more information soon. Um, the Professional Engagement Committee is working on putting together a virtual game night. Um, I'm very excited about that, just a chance to get together virtually during this trying time. So look for more information about that soon in the pipeline. Global news, again, ASEG has put together some really great resources, um, both just about the virus and safety um, throughout this time, process safety throughout this time. So I encourage you to look on ASEG's website. Um, and another fun thing that they're doing is Trivia Tuesdays. So if you're a member, you can go to ASCH Engage and answer some trivia questions. You can win a couple badges for your profile if you answer those questions. Um, other reminders, as always, if you're interested in becoming a local section member, uh, either email me or visit the webpage. It's very simple. And most of our past presentations are available on our local section website. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Sal to introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. We have the pleasure today of listening to Lauren Johnson a talk about the circular economy. Lauren is keenly aware of the complex challenges the world faces, and as a believer in the power and ingenuity of people, she promotes collaboration to create viable paths to enable us all to live well. She has been involved in community development, built a volunteer organization, the local chapter of Engineers Without Borders, which has improved lives of over 800 people in Somni, Peru, and drives impact at a global scale as a manager in Eastman's corporate sustainability organization, where she currently works on cross-functional teams on Eastman sustainability and circular economy commitments. When not working or volunteering, you can find Lauren enjoying live music, experimenting with new homebrew flavors, or exploring trails in the Appalachian Mountains. She is proud to be a lifelong Tennessean and resides in Johnson City. With that, Lauren, I will hand it over to you. Thank you again for taking the time to present on this. Yeah, thank you, Sal, for that nice introduction. And I'm sharing my screen now. Can you all see it? Yes, we can. Yes. Great. Yes. Right. Right. And, and you can hear me all right, I hope. Absolutely. Yes. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'm really excited to be here today talking with you all about circular economy, which you might have learned from my introduction is something that's near and dear to my heart and um, something that I spend a lot of my time at Eastman on. So this talk originally was scheduled for February as a follow-up to Bill Trapp's seminar on carbon renewal. So hopefully you recall some of that and I'll go over carbon renewal again, just, just a little bit, um, but this talk is to put that in context of the broader circular economy and to give you some information about the different, the drivers for a circular economy, the different business models that are being used and use Eastman as an example, and also talk some about how we as chemical engineers contribute to creating a circular economy. So have a lot of exciting information to share with you all today. All right, so I'll start with Eastman. Our purpose is to enhance the quality of life in a material way, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. And we've been doing that for 100 years. We're proud of our DNA as problem solvers, and right now our people are tackling the biggest problems we've ever faced. Our goal is to transform tomorrow by revolutionizing the materials that shape today. 
So let's talk about the big problems we're facing globally and the connection to improving the quality of life and how the circular economy fits into this picture. So as I just shared, our purpose is to improve the quality of life. And right now our world faces a sustainability crisis and the world faces at the moment at least three very real challenges that could impact the quality of life. First, we need to quickly figure out how we're going to efficiently and, and healthily and safely feed and care for a world that's fast approaching 10 billion people, which is an almost unimaginable number. Secondly, our climate is changing and there are a host of potential consequences associated with that on business, on health of people, on ecosystems, and so on. And third, we have a waste problem, specifically a plastic waste problem. Some details about that, if you're not familiar, China stopped taking the world's waste in 2018 under their national sword program. So that meant much of the developing world that had been shipping their waste to China and other Asian nations suddenly didn't have an outlet for it. Um, much of the or the developed world have been shipping that waste. And much of the developing world has severely insufficient waste management infrastructure. So even when waste is collected, it often goes to dumps that are empty by typhoons or tsunamis or, or other natural disasters. And island nations like Bali and Indonesia are overflowing with plastic waste that regularly makes its way into the oceans, uh, either directly or indirectly, through streams and rivers. So most of these nations are unable to manage their own waste, much less the waste that's collected in the developing world and shipped to them. So you might be thinking, well, these are all obviously huge challenges, but some people's quality of life is improving. And that's true. So I'll talk about that some. The fact is that while now no doubt billions of people struggle, by many indicators, the quality of life of people globally has been increasing and improving for decades. More people today have access to basics like clean water, people are living longer, more diseases have been eradicated or nearly so, and people are joining the middle class in droves. In fact, more than a billion more people, maybe a billion and a half, will join the middle class by 2030 that means they'll have discretionary income. So they're able to, in addition to covering their basic needs, they'll have some money left over for vacations and entertainment and so on. And the middle class, that middle class is really what drives the global economy. The unfortunate reality though, is that historically, these great improvements in quality of life have also come with massive increases in resource consumption. So you can see the chart on this slide here, correlating GDP per capita with resource usage per capita. So the implication is that the more developed nations with higher GDP per capita presumably uh, have people with a better quality of life. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the statistic that the world is already using over one and a half planets worth of resources every year. Based on that pace, we're going to consume more than three planets of resources by 2050, which is really just unthinkable. And that trajectory can't be sustained. So long story short, we have to find a way to break the relationship between improvement in quality of life and resource consumption. And we need to address the sustainability crises of climate change and the waste that is a side effect of this resource consumption because this trajectory can't be sustained if we want to continue improving the quality of lives. So the solution to this is the circular economy. So historically, the world's operated in this linear economy model on the left, where raw materials were extracted or harvested to make products. And this linear economy has, as, as we just talked about, has enabled many billions of people to lead better lives. The linear approach was really successful to satisfying demand. Companies were able to, um, with ever-increasing efficiency, extract materials, use those materials to manufacture products that are useful to everyday lives, sell them more efficiently, ship them more efficiently to consumers and customers who then, in most cases, use and discard them after they're done with them. So put shortly, uh, the linear economy is built on the principles of take, make, waste. Co 
contrast that with a circular economy, which focuses on maximizing and making the most of the world's resources. So minimizing waste and maximizing value by providing end-of-life solutions to reduce, reuse, and recycle products and materials that typically would end up in landfills and, unfortunately, waterways. So in that way, a circular economy keeps materials in play indefinitely and decouples growth, economic growth and development from the scarce resource consumption. So that allows improvements in quality of life within our planet's natural resource limits. Does somebody have a question? Okay. I meant to say when I started that if you have questions, please please raise your hand. There's a button you can click in Teams to, to raise your hand. So especially if you have clarifying questions, please do that. And um, my moderators are going to be keeping track of, of people who are asking questions. So I'd be glad to address those as I go through the presentation. And we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. All right, so diving into a circular economy. I want to, to take a minute and use Eastman's principles as an example. So circular economy is core to Eastman's innovation platform today. And these widely known principles that I'm sure you're all already familiar with, they were ingrained in me when I was a kid. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming it might be the same for you. These principles of reduce, reuse, and recycle are also core to enabling a circular economy. It's really a set of behaviors that aren't wasteful. So at Eastman, we fully support an aggressive push toward reduction and reuse. And we aim to produce products that enable that shift. So in fact, we wanna shift as many single use products to durable goods as possible. And in making that shift, we believe using the right material, we believe in using the right material in the right application. And that no material should ever be a single use material. So anytime a material ends up in a landfill, that's really a shame. It's a waste of a valuable resource that could continue serving human needs in a new product, in a new life, in a new product. So with that, let's take a deeper look at the principles of the circular economy. So the circular economy has three main principles, and I'm going to talk through these and then show you a diagram. So the first principle in a circular economy is to really preserve and enhance the resources that we have by managing them very well. So we want to manage our finite stores of resources, so those non-renewable resources that we call technical nutrients, and also managing and balancing the flows of renewable resources, so bio-based resources, um, solar energy even. The second principle is to optimize resource yields by continuing to circulate products and components and materials in their highest utility um, at all times. So that's the idea, again, of using the right material in the right application and upcycling materials at their end of use, not downcycling them. The third principle is to improve the overall system or the overall circular economy effectiveness by minimizing negative externalities. So externalities are those side effects or consequences, uh, unintended consequences that um, occur from an industrial activity or commercial activity but that aren't reflected in the cost of cost of goods or in the price of the services rendered. So externalities can be compensated for using other means. A, an example of that would be carbon taxes are a way of accounting for externalities. But ideally you wanna minimize externalities. So in the case of carbon taxes, you would want to emit less carbon so you don't have to pay carbon tax. So I'll show a diagram to again walk through the principles of the circular economy and some tactics that are used to to really bring the circular economy to life and after i do that i'm going to show you some business models as well so this diagram 
Uh, in my team, we lovingly refer to it as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's butterfly chart because it does look a little bit like a butterfly. So on the right side of the diagram, in the blue loops, you see finite materials. So those are non-renewable resources. And in the left side of the diagram are renewable materials. So natural materials um, like biochemical feedstocks. The idea of the circular economy, and I'm going to spend most of my time here talking about principle two. The idea of the circular economy is to keep a material or a product in the smallest loop that you can. So first, um, you would seek to design products using lasting resources. So resources that are either renewable or they're more durable and going to last longer, or they're infinitely recyclable somehow. Second, you would want to design a product that can be shared and optimally utilized. This is called li liquid markets, right? You want to eliminate the idle time of products by designing a product so that it's shareable and that it's easily accessible to be shared and maybe convertible between users. You also would seek to design products that have long life cycles. So they're made to last, they can be upgraded and remanufactured or refurbished and redistributed. That would be uh, the loops just outside the sharing loops there on the screen. And finally, one of the outer loops there is called linked value chain. So that's, that's really recycling. So when a product is no longer usable, it cannot be, it cannot be refurbished, it can't be remanufactured and redeployed when it's just no longer usable and it's time to break it down to its components and turn them into new products, you would want to recycle it. And so it needs to be made with materials that are recyclable and then linked to another value chain that can use that recycled material. So the interesting thing to me about a circular economy um, is that recycling is really the, in, in the circular economy philosophy, recycling is really the, the last resort almost. Um, you start by designing products that can be reused more, more and more and then maybe remanufactured and, and refurbished. And then recycling is the last option that you would want to, to utilize for a product once it's reached the end of its useful life. So keep that in mind as we're thinking about, as we're exploring and thinking about the five business models that companies are using to bring the circular economy to life for their customers. Okay, so let's start by orienting ourselves on the product lifecycle diagram on the right. So it starts from design and procurement through manufacturing and sales and use and end of life, and then closing the loop by re recycling and upcycling, right? So spend a minute to, to really take a look at this diagram and digest it. So some business models that companies are using to either shift their linear models to a circular model or, or some companies are, are startups and they're really enjoying the benefit of being one of the first companies in the space to use these models. Uh, there are five major models. One is circular supplies. And that's the idea of replacing scarce raw materials with renewable, bio-based, or fully recyclable inputs. So circular supplies come into play in this product life cycle at the product design and procurement stage. And an important note here, waste to energy and waste to fuel is not necessarily a completely circular business model, but it is one that some companies are using. So we'll, we'll give an example of that in a minute. The second business model is resource recovery. And you can think of it as closed loop recycling or cradle to cradle design, 
where waste materials are reprocessed into new resources and they're they're recycled or upcycled but not downcycled. So companies using a resource recovery model are leveraging reverse logistics to take back products at the end of their useful lives and using recycled te recycling technologies um, to, to break them down and turn them into new materials. And they also can capture byproducts from the manufacturing process and, and recycle them and turn them into new usable materials as well. So they're really diverting waste that would otherwise go to landfill and turning it into valuable feedstock. So just eliminating the concept of waste altogether there. A third business model is product life extension. So this is the idea of a company designing a product that is, it may be as modular. So if something breaks on it, you can very easily contact the company and they'll send you a replacement piece for it. Um, the company may also provide its customers with really easy repair tips and, and even repair um, materials to repair their own products so that they can continue to enjoy using their products and they last longer and they don't have to use more resources to manufacture and then purchase a new product. So, so that's product life extension. And a fourth business model is sharing platforms. And this is probably something that's going to be very familiar to a lot of us, but this is a model in which uh, you purchase a, a subscription sometimes. You could purchase a subscription as a consumer to receive products that maybe have been used by somebody else, but you can use them and then return them when you're done with them. Or you can, if you really like them, you can buy them at less than the retail price. <clears throat> and the fifth important business model category is products as a service. And that's where um, you would buy the service provided by the product, but the company retains the ownership of that product. So it it's also could be a subscription and the company would be responsible for maintaining the product and ensuring that you're getting the benefit of the product and then they would replace that product if it if it fails and you're no longer getting the benefit from it they would replace that product for as long as your contract is in effect. All right. So now that you've learned about the circular economy and what's driving the shift to the circular economy and the five kinds of business models that companies can adopt, I'd like for us to pause and do an activity. So we're going to do a live poll, which I hope is a fun way to interact since we can't all be in the room together today. And we're going to use our phones. So let's start by setting up the poll from your phone. It should take just a second. So you're going to want to text EMN poll, E-M-N-P-O-L-L, to the number 22333. And Aaron or Sal, just let me know when you have the poll on your, on your phone ready to roll. I'm ready on my end. Great. All right. So our poll is, what companies can you think of, you know, now that we've, we've talked about business models and I, I've described these business models to you, what companies can you think of that you think are already using circular business models? And these could be brands, they could be manufacturers, they could be local businesses that you're aware of. Um, just type in the name of the company and text it to the poll and you can send as many names as you want. Yeah, some really good ones coming in.
Very nice. I think I saw Eastman on there too. I mean, Patagonia obviously is very popular and they, they absolutely have been using circular models for a while. Wow. Well, thank you all for participating. Oh, I still have answers coming in. I, I hope you all can see the word cloud as it's being built on the screen as well. Wow, this is gonna give us some content for some, some more slides even, this is great. Okay, well, I hope everybody who wanted had a chance to submit their poll answers. You can still submit them when I switch away from the screen and the word cloud will continue to build. <clears throat> but I'm going to switch back over to the presentation now and, and we can continue talking about business models. All right. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for participating in that. I hope that it was fun. Um, my objective in, in the poll and then in using this time together is that you leave the, the talk today with a good understanding of the circular economy and the variety of ways that businesses and you can help make it successful. So I already spent some time talking about the business models. We'll, we'll wrap that up a minute in a minute. And then I'm going to explain the role that Eastman's playing with our circular recycling technologies. And um, then we're going to talk some about how different players in the value chain are interacting and, and how they can contribute to a circular economy and by extension, how you as chemical engineers can participate as well. All right, so revisiting the five business models with some examples this time. So circular supplies, I, I know several of you submitted some, some companies that were operating in, in each of these five models. Um, so I hope that as we go through this, you're, you're thinking about your submissions as well. So circular supplies, Royal DSM is operating in this model. They've developed a cellulosic bioethanol in which they're using ag residue, like corn cobs, and converting that into renewable fuel. And um, that's created a new revenue source for them, and it's also reducing greenhouse gas emissions and strengthening energy security. So a, a note about this, I mentioned it earlier, waste to fuel isn't necessarily completely circular since once the fuel is consumed, it's gone. But the idea of using the agricultural waste rather than landfilling or, or composting it um, or using any other sustainably harvested biomaterial is, is the idea here that's good to model. So the second circular economy business model is resource recovery, and that is where Eastman is playing. So we'll talk more about that in the next section. Product life extension. So several folks, uh, a lot of folks, submitted Patagonia and, and REI is similar. So this is where companies have repair services for products, for example, and uh, maybe even have in, in store or in, in shop repairs. So you can take your outdoor gear and get it repaired while you're in the store. Another good example of this product life extension model is Caterpillar and their reman service. So that focuses on remanufacturing technologies for cat machines and engine parts to make them good as new. So the idea is that, is that the Caterpillar consumer returns a used core component for a remanufactured product, and that reduces the need for raw materials to produce the new parts. 
and sharing platforms, I saw a lot of those pop up on, on our poll. So Gwynny B is the example on our slide. It's a clothing subscription company that allows you to get the latest trends and wear them and then return them if, if you don't love them. And if you do love them, you can buy it. Um, some other models that I saw show up on the word cloud were Airbnb and Lyft. And those are excellent examples. Another example would be companies that offer co-working spaces. So that's where um, they, they own the office building and they rent out the office space, conference rooms, Wi-Fi, et cetera, for a weekly or monthly fee based on the amount of space you need and, and the time you need to be in the office. And you can probably think of several other sharing platforms that have become really popular in the past few years. The final business model is products as a service. And this, this one is one that's really interesting to me. So we have two examples in this area. The first one is Interface, which is a carpet and luxury vinyl tile company. And it's got a program called Reentry, where Interface takes the interface carpet from your facility. When it reaches the end of its life, they'll take it back, uh, grind it and make pellets and then create new backing for it. So they offer that as a service when you purchase flooring for your building from them. Another example is Philips Lighting. So Philips offers lights as a service for reuse and recycling and to minimize your carbon footprint and waste. So that means you as a, a building owner or building occupant don't have to make an upfront investment for capital or maintenance or replacement. You buy, you buy the light, um, but not the equipment itself. So you're paying to have your building lit, but you're not paying to buy the equipment. So it's a pretty cool business model. Okay. Now that we've covered circular business models and you know that Eastman is directly leveraging a resource recovery model, let's spend some time diving into the drivers for the resource recovery model and the technology that's leveraged in resource recovery and the latest on Eastman's progress in the area. Okay, so I'll start with this. Over 450 major brands, retailers, and other organizations have signed on to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's global commitment. And that means they're committed to using at least 25% recycled content in their products by 2025. This on the slide is a selection of the brands. So it's companies that we all know that make products we love and trust and use every day. By making this commitment, they're promising to eliminate the plastic they don't need by innovating the plastics they do need to be 100% reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And they're also committing to circulate the plastic they use um, through bold recycle content goals. And this is going to be very hard to, to put into action. At Eastman, we plan to serve a critical role enabling these bold commitments by enabling the achievement of very high recycled content and doing that with lower greenhouse gas emissions, so thereby addressing the climate crisis. We also realize that achieving these commitments is going to be impossible with mechanical recycling and alone. And, and what do I mean by this? So let me show you the data that say these commitments are impossible with mechanical recycling alone. So speaking of plastic, of the 300 million metric tons of plastics produced every year, 260 million are disposed, so that's 40%, end up in landfill, 25% are incinerated, and most alarmingly, almost a fifth of them end up in the environment. And this is the plastic that gets swept away in, into rivers and streams and ends up in the ocean. Only 16% of plastics disposed today get collected for mechanical recycling. And of that, only 12% actually ends up getting mechanically recycled in the United States. So once you digest the numbers a bit, it's not hard to see quantitatively that we have a plastic waste problem and, and there's a gap 
between the need that brands have, the brands that have committed to using recycled plastic and the technologies and infrastructure's ability to provide that recycled content. There's just simply not enough mechanically recycled plastic to fulfill the brand's current recycled content commitments. So new advanced recycling technologies need to be deployed and scaled up. And we'll take a look at them in the next slide. Recently, and, and you've heard about this because of Eastman's annou announcements, but recently there have been a lot of developments and activity around chemical recycling. And what's shown on the slide here is what, what I call a recycling hierarchy or a waste hierarchy of the various chemical recycling technologies and mechanical recycling is, is down at the tip of the pyramid or the tip of the triangle. So, uh, a brief tour through these technologies, conversion, decomposition, and purification. Conversion technology breaks down the raw materials the furthest. So the outputs from conversion technology are, are often things like syngas. Um, the raw materials that can be fed to conversion technologies can be uh, really impure, actually. So the, the level of purity required is shown on the diagram at the right, and the level of breakdown that these technologies achieve is, is shown on the scale at the left. So conversion technologies would include technologies like pyrolysis, reforming, or anaerobic digestion and conversion. The next chemical recycling technology is called decomposition. So it's a process that uh, decomposes plastic into its monomers. And that could include hydrolysis, glycolysis, methanolysis. Purification is an interesting technology as well. It involves dissolving the plastic in a solvent and, and then extracting and, and filtering it to obtain a purified plastic. So a technology that would fall in that category would be solvent extraction. And finally, finally, mechanical recycling, which is the most traditional form of recycling used today, it takes essentially monomaterial plastic products and grinds, wash, washes them, and melts them to be used in new applications. So mechanical recycling breaks down the materials the least, but requires the, the purest inputs. And conversely, conversion technologies break down materials the most, but can handle a wide variety of inputs. So I'll show you examples of companies that are using these technologies. You see Eastman shows up on there in, in conversion and decomposition, as well as some of the companies that you all had entered on the poll earlier. So BASF, Sobic, some of our peers are also leveraging conversion te technologies for chemical recycling. And a note about purification technologies. Uh, there's a company called PureCycle that was launched by Procter & Gamble, actually, um, using purification technology, and another one called Polystivert that is dissolving polystyrene and, and purifying it to remake into polystyrene. So I thought that was interesting, one that we don't hear about too often. All right, so I'll take a minute to say a, f a few more comments on mechanical and chemical recycling because you saw they're in, they're in the waste hierarchy together. And when people say made with recycled content, that has historically meant mechanical recycling. And as we innovate to create new chemical recycling technologies, there's been a debate about which is better, chemical or mechanical. And reality, the conversation shouldn't be mechanical recycling versus chemical recycling. It should be mechanical recycling and chemical recycling because they're complementary. So we'll look at why that's the case. Mechanical recycling is the most efficient and environmentally friendly recycling process because cleaning, chopping, and remelting takes far less energy than any of the other recycling processes. So it has the best greenhouse gas footprint. However, one of the limitations of mechanical recycling technology and probably one of the reasons that mechanical recycling um, 
is such a low percentage of the recovered plastics today is that it recovers a fairly it, it requires a fairly clean source of materials and those materials are limited and mechanical recycling results in reduced performance properties because the material can only be recycled a finite number of times due to degradation compare that with chemical recycling still has an improved greenhouse gas footprint versus making products from virgin fossil materials. And when you chemically recycle, the final product is indistinguishable from that made from virgin fossil materials. It enables the polymer to be reprocessed an infinite number of times. So that's critical to creating a truly circular system. And chemical recycling can accept a broad range of waste as input. So these are two very different approaches to recycling with clearly different benefits. Mechanical recycling should be leveraged whenever possible. When, and when that's not enough, chemical recycling should then be used. All right, so where does Eastman fit into all of this? So we believe we need to invest in chemical recycling technology and work together collaboratively with, with many parties to build robust collection infrastructure to capture more of, more of the waste and um, make it accessible to companies like us that want to chemically recycle it. Eastman's advanced circular technologies can be used to renew the materials that are otherwise bound for landfill, incineration, or worse, the environment. So at Eastman, we're almost singularly focused on this right now. It's becoming part of our DNA. And it, we believe that if we truly want to live our brand of enhancing the quality of life, this has to be part of our story going forward. So I want to share over the next slides some updates on our circular solutions that we've launched at Eastman over the past several months. So it's not intended to be an Eastman commercial, but just instead to give you an update and build on what you learned in January. Eastman has three major types of recycle technologies. And we're only, today, we're only going to focus on the new chemical recycling technologies that we refer to as advanced circular recycling technologies. They're here on the right side of the slide. Those are carbon renewal technology, CRT, and polyester renewal technology, or PRT. So at Eastman, we think that chemical recycling should only be used for material to material solutions, like mechanical recycling. But in the case of chemical recycling, we want we aim to keep the carbon or keep the, the plastic in play forever. So that means we prefer chemical recycling that's circular, unlike waste energy or waste of fuel solutions. <clears throat> and I'll give you an overview of our chemical recycling technologies that we're using today. So in the fourth quarter of 2019, we launched CRT, which is able to take mixed plastic waste stream and convert it into polymers and fibers for a wide range of plastic and textile applications that we sell into. So the recycled content can be tuned for the application, but has a wide range. And this might not sound like a lot on the surface, but these products are part of our cellulosic platform and thus the, the bulk of the rest of the content is bio-based. So we're able to use the carbon renewal technology to make products that are both recycled and bio-based, which is really fantastic because those products are circular. And another added benefit of carbon renewal is that the intermediates made using this technology have a 20 to 50 percent lower carbon footprint than those made with the virgin fossil feedstock and that's hugely important especially to our customers that are looking to reduce the footprint in the products that they're making but also in in the bigger picture as we're looking to address the the climate change crisis any steps we take to lower our footprint are steps in the right direction In the first quarter of 2020, we launched our polyester renewal technology, which converts polyester waste into a broad range of polyester uh, of polymers. The recycled content can also be tuned for the applications uh, of these products, and it can be tuned from 25% to about 97%. 
and polyester renewal technology we're running right now we're running glycolysis for polyester renewal <clears throat> and we aim to have our methanolysis operational in 2022 this technology is only suitable for pet the glycolysis is limited to clear PET as a feedstock, but methanolysis can take a wider range of, of PETs, like carpets, color PET. It breaks down the PET to DMT and EG, and we use the, the DMT and EG in our specialty copolyester and specialty plastics manufacturing to make new products uh, or renewed products. And like carbon renewal, one of the exciting aspects of this technology uh, is that the intermediates, the DMT and EG, have a 20 to lower, 20 to 30 percent lower carbon footprint than those same monomers made from virgin fossil feedstock. So that's that's very exciting. So, as you might imagine, we're excited both about the recycled content claims because of the the contributions to circular economy the diversion of waste from landfill and our improving and, and enhanced ability to meet customer needs because our customers are asking for recycled content. But we're also excited about the impact these solutions have on the environment in terms of the carbon footprint. So I'm going to say a little bit more about that. So this slide is an overview of just a, a sampling of three of the circular products that we can make using our advanced circular recycling technology. So these are three of our plastics. And for every 5 kmt of each of these plastics, you can see the direct benefits in terms of environmental impact on this slide. So this, this connects back into the waste problem that I framed up earlier and the climate crisis. So for every 5 kmt of Triton Renew that's made, that's got 87% recycled content. So everybody's got these water bottles, right? You'll be able to buy water bottles like, like this um, with 87% recycled content sometime in the future. So for every 5 kmt that Eastman makes of Triton, more than 4 kmt of waste was diverted from landfill um, and 2,500 to 3,500 metric tons of CO2 was not emitted. And that's the equivalent of taking six to nine or driving six to nine million less miles. So 550 to 750 passenger cars taken off the road in one year. That's, that's a real impact and that's something that we're really proud of. And so this, this slide is for every five KMT of plastics that we make, we're able to, to calculate the benefits, the environmental benefits and the, the connection to landfill diversion and circular economy. <clears throat> but the really exciting thing is that our advanced circular recycling technologies are in the position to, for us to process 30 to 50 million pounds or 23 KMT of waste in 2020, which that's much bigger than the five KMT. And we're going to grow that number exponentially in the coming years. So we've launched commercial scale chemical recycling for a broad set of plastics that are currently being landfilled or leaked into the environment we're replacing fossil feedstocks in our processes with plastic waste feedstocks. So we're closing the loop and helping to create a circular economy. We're able to make products that contain 25 to almost 100% recycled content. And we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and doing it at a, a scale that's, that's really impactful. So as a matter of fact, one more tidbit that I'm really excited to share. By February of this year, we had processed a million and a half pounds or, or almost 700 met tons of plastic waste using these technologies. And that's equivalent to three times the amount of plastic waste that's collected by Kingsport every year. So just, just in a couple of year, in a couple of months earlier this year, we processed more plastic than, than three times the amount that Kingsport would collect 
in a year. So that's very exciting. And we're going to scale that up exponentially in the coming years. All right, pull time again. Now that we've discussed the big picture of circular business models, companies employing them in different ways, and then you've gotten an in-depth look and update on Eastman's progress using the resource recovery model right here in our backyards, I want us to take a step back out again to view the entire value chain. And we're going to kick that off with another poll question. You should still be connected to the poll from earlier, but in case not, here are the instructions again. Okay, so the next poll question is, which part of the value chain do you think has the most impact or responsibility to create a circular economy? So review this list and then just text the letter. You don't have to text the whole name, just text A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. You know, as you're thinking about circular economy, who do you think has has the most responsibility to make changes or who, if they make changes, could have the most impact? And Aaron or Sal, just let me know when you've successfully answered the poll. I'll use you all as a gauge. I was able to get it done. Great. Okay, looks like we still have a few responses coming in. This is actually probably easier than having people raise their hands in a big room. <laughs> All right. This is really interesting. So, oops. So a lot of a lot of you have said that manufacturers have the most responsibility to create a circular economy or maybe could have the most impact in creating a circular economy. And, and more of you even said that consumers or end users have the most responsibility. And that's, that's great. It's a little bit of a trick question though, because I would say the answer is really everyone. Um, everyone across the supply chain has a role to play in creating a successful circular economy from the raw material suppliers, like farmers or even recyclers, to designers, to manufacturers, to consumers. And enabling the circular economy also requires collaboration among partners that may never have worked together in this way. So let's take a look at this. So while so while, while circular models um, open up possibilities, we really have to have collaboration to make them work well for everyone. And at each of the steps in the value chain that we just explored in the poll, there are many opportunities for creativity and innovation to find circular materials and to design circular solutions. So I'm going to step through these and offer you my thoughts on how, each, how folks working at each of these levels can contribute to a circular economy. So raw material suppliers have the opportunity to source recycled, landfill diverted, or bio-based raw materials to displace the non-renewables that they're currently supplying to their customers. Manufacturers, similar, um, and they also have the opportunity to use renewable or other low carbon energy. They have the opportunity to leverage artificial intelligence and other powerful technology to improve manufacturing capabilities. Um, you could look into the fourth industrial revolution for information about that. And of course, rolled into manufacturers would be those using advanced recycling technologies as well. So we've, we've covered that uh, a great deal today. Product designers is an area where, where I think folks who are working as product designers or making decisions about product design have a huge amount of power over how the circular economy is going to look and how rapidly it's going to be deployed. So product designers can design products with sharing in mind, 
or they could create a modular design for easy repair or to be easily refurbished or remanufactured or to be easily disassembled and recycled once it can no longer be repaired. Brands and retailers similarly have the decision rights over what they're selling in their stores and what they're hanging their brand on, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the principles and the values that they're hanging their brands on. And they have the opportunity, again, to commit to using circular products and to working with designers that design for circularity, to buy from manufacturers and suppliers that are providing circular materials. Recyclers, obviously a huge business opportunity for them. And it's also a great time to collaborate to create better collection infrastructure, new ways of sorting material or additional ways to process materials and prepare them for the variety of types of recycling in addition to the traditional mechanical methods. Regulators, and that, that might have been a surprise to be on the poll, but regulators are playing a big role here in the creation of circular economy. So they have the opportunity to create policy framework that facilitates rapid adoption and expansion of circular models, particularly chemical recycling and the infrastructure to enable materials to get to the chemical recyclers. Regulators also have the ability to advantage or disadvantage types of materials and types of recycling. So for example, they, uh, regulation could impact shipment of waste across oh. national boundaries, or it could impact how chemical recycling or if chemical recycling is considered as recycling like mechanical recycling is. And finally, consumers. As consumers, we have the opportunity to make more conscious buying decisions and to eliminate waste and maximize the usefulness or the utility of the products that we're buying. Really, everyone has the power to be an advocate for a more comprehensive recycling, pro recycling system by talking about the issue with their state and local representatives, of course, buying items that have recycled content, and asking questions about how we can all work together for a better, a better overall system. So I hope that in one or more of these areas, you can see how your role and expertise as chemical engineers is valuable and essential to creating a circular economy. Your expertise can help shape decisions around raw materials used as reactants. You can design processes and individual unit ops using circular principles in mind. This is something that I would argue we do already with heat recovery and, and solvent recycle loops and so on. And this could be leveraged more fully and you don't have to be in a technical or manufacturing role either to help build a circular economy. It's honestly, it's been years since I worked in a lab or in the plant. Uh, you can use your systems thinking experience and that's what a lot of chemical engineering is. And, and the circular economy is a big system after all. You can use that systems thinking to come up with ideas and solutions. So now that you know more about the circular economy, you can start asking the right questions. And I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to go ahead and skip the next couple of slides and get to the close. So we will know we've succeeded in creating a circular economy when. So I, I think we've all seen memes that go something like, you know you're a 90s kid if you recognize this, and then they show a light bright or a VCR or some other little toy or gadget that was useful and popular then, but is now lo no longer popular and it may be nostalgic. So I think we'll know we've succeeded in creating a circular economy when adults years from now look at posts like that that say, you know you're a 2020s kid if you recognize this, and a household trash can is on the list because that's when we'll know we've stopped seeing waste. And instead we're seeing feedstock or valuable sources to be turned into new products. All right, that's my last slide. Thank you so much for your attention and I'll be around for the discussion session if you have questions.